Hello, I'm Bob Lofterthun, Interim Executive Director of the Northern Virginia Resource Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Persons. We're located in Fairfax County. We've been around since 1988, and our mission is to empower deaf and hard of hearing individuals and their families through education, advocacy, and community involvement. We're producing a series of programs that we hope will inform and educate the hearing community about the deaf community, a very vibrant sector of our society. So we hope as a result of these programs, uh, people will understand more about the history of the deaf community in the United States, as well as deaf culture. So today's uh, program is on uh, generational experiences in deaf education in America. So our guests today are Tom Dowling, and Lee Balayan, and Brad Staten. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought maybe we could uh, lead off, and Lieb, asking you a question about what was deaf life and deaf education like in the very beginning of the United States? In America, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, life was more of a rural existence. This led to deaf children living more isolated from each other. Many hearing parents who had deaf children believed that deaf children couldn't be educated. These parents didn't know much about deafness at all. For example, they believed if they couldn't literally hear the word of God, they couldn't be saved. A priest would even go as far as placing their hands on deaf children's ears, trying to heal the deafness out of them. Obviously, it didn't work. So Tom, what, uh, what changed that situation for uh, deaf people in the United States? Yeah, it's an interesting history. Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet was the one person who really made a difference for people who are deaf. At that time, he had neighbors that were the Cogswell family, and they had a child who was deaf, and her name was Alice. She had no communication. Pastor Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, he was fascinated by the child's situation and wanted to find a way to communicate with her. So the Cogswell family decided to help fund Gallaudet's trip to Europe. Gallaudet sailed to Europe and visited two schools for the deaf, where they offered oralism. He felt, he felt that it was too limiting and not a good fit. And he wasn't going to get the support he needed from them. That's when he decided to go to France, the Paris School for the Deaf where then he met Abbé du Lepé, who was a teacher for the deaf, and he was also introduced, Gallaudet, to Laurent Clare, another teacher for the deaf. Gallaudet was intrigued by Laurent Clare's approach to teaching the deaf. And Gallaudet proposed to Laurent Clare to come back to America with him to help the deaf children. During that time together, Clare taught Gallaudet some signs. After arriving in America, Clare met Alice. All of this led to the establishment of the first deaf school, the American School for the Deaf. Deaf children from around of the surrounding areas were brought together to be educated. And it took off from there. That's, a, that's an interesting historical story. And Anthony, when, um, when Gallaudet came over with Clerk, uh, how did that affect deaf education in the United States and sign language? ASL just took off and grew. Many s schools opened for the deaf at the time, Abraham Lincoln signed into law that colleges could confer or grant degrees to deaf students. 
primarily Gallaudet University, or Gallaudet College at that time. Edward Minor Gallaudet, who was the son of Tom Hopkins Gallaudet, was the founder of Gallaudet College in 1864. By the end to mid 19th century, ASL took root in the country. Gallaudet University was previously Gallaudet College in 1860s, and Gallaudet University was established in 1887. And then Tom, um what was a challenge came about to ASL, right? What, what, where did that come from? Yeah, at this point in American history, there was a name, a man named Alexander Graham Bell, or AGB. You may know him as the inventor of the telephone. He had it patented in 1876, prior to the invention of the telephone. AGB was married to a deaf woman, and he was, his mother was also deaf. After observing his wife and mother's situation, he, moved, he was moved to believe that being deaf was something to be eradicated. He believed that deaf children could be taught to speak better and proposed oralism to be taught to deaf students in deaf schools. He opened up the first school in Boston in 1871. Over the next five years, he ran his school. This preceded the invention of the telephone in 76. He became very influential and successful. This drew many people to his beliefs and methodologies and it spread throughout other schools in the area. He also believed that sign language should be eradicated and he, f he encouraged lip reading and speaking for deaf children in schools. He also tried to remove deafness through eugenics. He believed this could be achieved by preventing deaf people from marrying each other and breeding deaf children and controlling the deaf population. It's very unfortunate. It's hard to believe that um, they could take that philosophy. So it really did have a negative impact on um, the sign language. And on top of that, there was a conference going on around that time. And, and Brad, what was that about? Well, in, in 1880, there was the Milan Conference for the Deaf mm -hmm. Educators in Italy. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to decide whether or not to uh, continue using sign language in the instructions of deaf children. So they went ahead and voted that no, they're not going to use sign language for deaf children. So they're going to use all of them. In other words, use speaking and lip reading to teach the deaf children. Right. Well, the United States and uh, England they voted no, but mm -hmm. of course they were overruled. And so um, after that, mm -hmm. the National Association of the Deaf, NAD, their membership increased a uh, lot. So right. deaf people were joining NAD at that time so they can have support because mm -hmm. all of them is not what they wanted. And uh, Gallagher University continued to teach sign language, but they had to include uh, all of them in lip reading. They had to do that. And all the schools had to incorpor incorporate uh, lip reading and speaking. Right. And a lot of the schools were closed. You know, they closed it because mm -hmm. they couldn't support sign language. And so the, they were forbidden to teach any sign language. So it was a big, uh, big deal. 70 years of no use of sign language in the school. Right. It's really a sad time. And, and from what I understand, people still used it unofficially, but if they were caught using it, yeah. they were actually punished in the schools, yes, right? Yes, they were. They actually had to wear gloves tied together oh, good so grief. they couldn't use the sign language. Right. They got their hands slapped 
all the time, for mm -hmm. instance, sign language. The kids, they maintained ASL in the schools in the dorm, you know, right. they lived at the, at the schools for the deaf. So mm -hmm. in the dorm, they would use the sign language. So that's how ASL continued to uh, thrive throughout time. Mm -hmm. But in the classroom, it was forbidden. So really, Gallaudet University was kind of like this educational yeah. island, if you will, in deaf education that really helped keep alive American Sign oh, Language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, starting in the 1950s and 60s, uh, there started to be movement or uh, resurgence of ASL, and I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of background on that. Well, in the 1950s, there was a professor named uh, William Stokey. Uh -huh. Stokey is his sign right. name at ah. Gallagher University. He right. did some research, and he did a lot of uh, research on ASL, American Sign Language, mm -hmm. and he really, uh, you know, define that uh, ASL was a true language. Mm -hmm. So that really promoted the use of ASL because it was a true language and not something that was adopted from France. Uh. So uh, with his help, you know, uh, it promoted the use of ASL mm -hmm. and they uh, published the first American Sign Language Dictionary. Ah, okay. To, the use of the yeah. dictionary. So that was uh, available to the public mm -hmm. to uh, learn sign language. And also during the 50s and 70s, they mm -hmm. had the women's rights movement and they right. had the civil rights movement, sure. which really encouraged the deaf community to push the use of ASL and use sign language. Mm -hmm. And so slowly the barriers between not using ASL and the use of sign language became stronger right. throughout time right. and um, so and then all the way into the 1980s when um, there was what they call the Deaf President Now um, DPM movement mm -hmm. where they were right. being ready to hire a hearing president of Gallagher University. Well the students there just stood up and protested because they said no they want someone right. to represent them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a Deaf president. So they protested in 1988, you know, they completely shut down the campus and everything. So finally the board at Gallagher University, you know, hired a Deaf mm -hmm. president. Right. who was a uh, deaf professor there at Gallagher, I. King Jordan. Right. So that really, you know, blew up uh, the ASL movement. Right, right. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a huge event here in Washington, D.C. I was uh, living here at that time, mm -hmm. so it was a huge uh, social event and uh, got a lot of support mm -hmm. uh, from people all across the country. So it was, it was one of those empowering moments that are great to see in history. Um, and then in the 1970s, um, with the uh, passage of the uh, Individual, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, um, Individual uh, Disabilities Education Act, with the IDEA Act, how did how did that impact uh, deaf education? Well, what it did was it, it what they call the mainstreaming law. Okay. And it, it allowed the kids instead of going to the schools for the deaf, uh -huh. they were going to be mainstreamed in the public schools closer to home because okay. many of the deaf schools were uh, located somewhere else, sometimes many miles from home. So uh, the mainstreaming act uh, act allowed the people to uh, be educated closer to home, mm -hmm. plus providing interpreters, providing whatever services they need to get an education, whereas before they didn't have that. Right. So, um, and, and that was, that was a, a, big, a big deal at that time. Right, right. And it really changed deaf education in the United States. Yes, it did. It, yeah. uh, and then it also created what they call uh, total communication, which is the use of sign language and talking at the same time. Uh, so a lot okay. of the professors and mm -hmm. teachers in the school right. were required to use what they call total communication. So they had to sign and talk at the same time. So really, they were incorporating oralism and sign language at the same time. Okay. So it was an interesting time in the 1970s. Okay. So and in the 80s, it continued. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was the big thing. And even at Gallagher University, they mm -hmm. used total communication for many years. It required even the deaf teachers had to talk uh, and sign at the same time. Okay, is that still prevalent, or is that no. sort of a philosophy that went the way of history? It, it kind of just dissipated uh, uh -huh. throughout time. I'm, I'm finding that Gallagher professors don't have to use their voices anymore. And now in the mainstream school, they still use you know, signing and total communication, or they use an interpreter. And so a sign language interpreter to teach the classes. Mm -hmm. So it's 
it depends on the school. Sometimes you'll see them signing, talking at the same time, but at Gallagher University, they don't. They just sign as it should be, mm -hmm. I think. Well, it's, it, to me, as I'm hard of hearing, I wear two hearing aids, um, and I'm typical of hard of hearing or hearing people really didn't have an, a knowledge of deaf community, deaf history, deaf education. So hearing this is, is it's very uh, informative for me. Um, and I thought what would be uh, what would be even more informative is since you really represent three different generations, is just to ask you what your educational experience was like. So Tom, since you're the senior person here, uh, I'll start with you first. So what was your educational uh, experience like growing up? Okay, well it was one of the most difficult experiences of my life. I was born to hearing parents and they didn't know how to provide an appropriate education. They seeked help from people in the schools in our community I was later enrolled for two years in public school. Then they decided to take me out and put me in another private school run by Catholic Charities. That's where I was taught to lip read and the oralism method in the classroom. I went there from nine years. As, as Brad mentioned, we were, if we were caught using gestures in the classroom, well, I was punished. I had to stand in the corner in the classroom like a monkey. But, you know, but at the end, I was sent to a private high school where I met two other deaf boys. We became each other's support for the next four years throughout high school. We had no other support system from the school no interpreters, no, note take, no written notes, no help from anybody else. At the end of high school, we were expected to enter a vocational program. When I took my Gallaudet entrance exam, I didn't think I was going to get in. But to my surprise, I passed. It was amazing. When I got to Gallaudet, it opened a whole new world of communication. We were able to have dialogues in the classroom, discussions, no more writing back and forth on slips of paper. It was very different than my old schooling days back in Chicago. Well, that's, it's a very interesting and uh, illustrative story about all the challenge that you faced and what, uh, what an education at Gallaudet made for you. And, and Brad, uh, since you're next, uh, could you describe your educational experience? Sure. I was born hard of hearing or uh, profoundly hard of hearing. I was born and at that time they didn't have any way of diagnosing my hearing loss. So mm -hmm. they thought I had a mental impairment. So they sent me to the school uh, for the mental disabled. Wow. And I was there for one year and uh, fortunately for me there was a new doctor that came to town and they tested me and said no he has a hearing loss so uh, my parents decided immediately the only thing they could do was to send me to the Virginia School for the Deaf and the Blind where I went for one year and then at that time the uh, mainstreaming law was passed oh. in 1973 mm -hmm. so they decided to send me to a program that was established in Roanoke my hometown uh, where the mainstreaming program for the deaf and during the day they had deaf classes and in the afternoon that you were sent to hearing classes and so and that was a, a good experience for me because I can still be with my peers in the classroom right. and then uh, my parents felt like I was more hearing than deaf so they transferred me to uh, an elementary school in my in my hometown of Salem Virginia and so but I had no interpreter I had no any kind of note-taking or anything so it was really wow. a frustrating experience for me because being hard of hearing I still can't hear what's happening in the classroom mm -hmm. so uh, and I went through all through high school and I, mean, I, I managed I think I was lucky because there were small classes so and then I went on to a hearing 
here in college, mm -hmm. and I struggled in, in college because there was no interpreters, no note takers, anything. Right. So, I mean, I struggled through two years of college. Well, at that time, the uh, Gallagher University had the protest, you know, that I mentioned earlier right. in 1988. That president and now. it just yeah. opened my eyes. So I went up there for a visit, mm -hmm. and I decided, oh, this is what I need. So I transferred to Gallagher, and it really opened up like Tom. It opened up a world to me, mm -hmm. and I was able to sit in the classroom, get an education, be able to discuss with the other students. It was really a good experience mm -hmm. for me. That's great. And uh, Andaly, um, you're the youngest here, uh, and if you could describe uh, your, your educational experience growing up. I grew up here in Fairfax County, from elementary school through high school. I was in the Fairfax County public school system. I was fortunate enough to have interpreters. I was in a deaf education program, small classes, as well as being mainstreamed classes with interpreters. I had an IEP that was developed by my teachers and parents. It was in those meetings we decided that I would be mainstreamed with interpreters. Then when I went to Gallaudet University, there were more people just like me than I've experienced ever before. And that Well, I have two deaf children that were born and raised here. They were in an oral and speech program at the time. And we talked to the social worker about the program being offered to my children. And I told them that they would need to communicate in sign language at home without interference from the school. To this day, my children and their education exceeds four or five times greater than mine or my wife's education level. It's amazing to see, and I commend Fairfax County Public Schools for the help for my two girls and Annalise such as yourself. I feel fortunate they offered FM systems that could be connected to our hearing aids. Not everyone used it. It was more based on an individual need. Also, transportation was provided, such as myself. I lived about 25 minutes from school, so all the deaf would be bused to one location where the deaf education program was. So the educational system in the United States has really improved quite a bit over the last 50 years, and that, that's great to see. Um, and Tom, your children were fortunate in that you were, you're deaf and you sign, but at the same time, you're mentioning your parents uh, were hearing uh, parents. And I think what a lot of hearing people don't realize is that about 90% of deaf children, their parents are hearing. And so in the very early formative years in preschool, that's very important to have signing and English. And uh, I know that you're uh, instrumental in the Lead K movement uh, here in Virginia, uh, preschool education. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, that's right. Well, LEAD K stands for Language Equality and Acquisition for Deaf Kids. We proposed a bill in Virginia last year, but it failed because of there was a strong movement from another group. We tried to emphasize that in the bill, it would offer all children from ages birth to five the right to communicate within sign language or, lang or English literacy, or both. I hope when it is in introduced again in the fall, we will all have your support of this bill. Well, I know that NVRC will be supporting it, and I'm sure many members of the deaf community will be supporting it because uh, there's a lot of research out there that learning ASL actually helps young children learn English as well. 
Uh, so it's uh, reading English and, and English in general. So it's a, I think it's a very important movement. I think preschool in general, preschool education, has been more and more recognized as far as its value. And I think the LEAD K program of preschool education uh, would be uh, very, very beneficial. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely be doing what we can to advocate for that. Um, are there any other uh, suggestions you might have based on your own experiences as far as uh, current day uh, deaf education? Or do you think we're, things are moving along pretty well uh, and, and uh, hopefully with the addition of uh, Lead K preschool education? Well, let me ask you this then. Um, yeah. what, um, what, how do you feel, uh, and, and Tom and Brad, you have much longer experience, and, and uh, Andalib is a young professional starting out in her career. How do you feel uh, your education, and including Andalib, has helped you or helped you prepare for the work world? Because as we know, uh, you know most of uh, people in the work world are hearing. You may come across deaf workers, hard of hearing workers. So if you could uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, what was that trans transition like? Uh, Tom, I guess we'll start off with you. Fortunately, how I was raised and exposed to the hearing world, having to be in an all hearing classroom, I had to adapt my communication to things such as reading lips or writing notes back and forth. When I graduated from Gallaudet, I had to face the same reality in the hearing world. I started my professional career working for a government agency. Well, I'm retired now about five years after 42 years of service in the federal government. Looking back at the people who I worked with, I'm surprised at the number of people who learned sign. I had the opportunity to teach them and engage with them. It made my job a lot easier. Sometimes I would leave notes on the whiteboard and the whiteboard would be covered with notes at times. I was fascinated with the and it was able to communicate better with my coworkers than my parents unfortunately. And uh, Brad, what about you? Uh, for me, uh, since I started working for the government, you know, Department of Defense, mm -hmm. a lot later than Tom did, but I found that, you know, being involved in the hearing world, my mm -hmm. family and everything, I was able to, you know, I can lip read, mm -hmm. and I was able to, you know, with a lot of speech therapy, I was able to communicate with my manager. Plus, technology has improved a lot, so yes. I can use, you know, telephone with the amplifier on mm -hmm. it, and, and I'm always able to get interpreters for meetings and things that we would have, especially big meetings. So mm -hmm. I felt like that, you know, my deaf education at Gallaudet really supported me to know what it is that I can get, you know, in my workplace. So, right. so far, you know, after 25 years of working for the government, you know, I've been doing well, I think, and mm -hmm. I'm able to get any kind of uh, support to get my job done. That's great. And Andalib, uh, you're one year out of Gallaudet University with a degree in accounting. And uh, how, do you, how do you feel Gallaudet or the, that educational experience prepared you for uh, the workforce? Really, it helped me a lot. Having a deaf teacher teach me accounting made everything more clear. I was able to learn a lot quickly. Then, I was able to bring my experience to NVRC, which I really enjoyed. It's been a good experience working with you, Bob, and the both of you. And I, uh, full disclosure, uh, Anne Lieb is our new finance and accounting manager. We're very uh, pleased to have her on board. Well, it's been fascinating listening to your histories, and I know I found it very informative and educational, and I hope the audience found it uh, the same way. Um, and if you want any more information, uh, you'll see on the screen there, www.nvrc.org, info at nvrc.org, and our telephone number. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in, and hope to see you again soon.